Hallelujah. Let's thank God for our music ministry. Amen. Aren't they amazing and wonderfully anointed to position us to receive and hear from the Lord? Amen. Thank God for Lauren and her, their whole team of singers and and instrumentalists and artists. So we, we, we still got more space and room for all of you all that love to sing and, and uh, bless God through your gifts on instruments. Amen. Feel free to connect with Lauren and, and uh, any of the team members, and they'll get you super integrated in the name of the Lord. This is our final sermon in our series on seasons, and uh, we have been... Uh, talking and tackling uh, some, I think, important topics and conversations as it relates to how do you and I transition during and through seasons uh, of uh, difficulty, seasons of triumph, seasons of learning, seasons of tribulation, um, knowing that we always are gifted with an opportunity to learn, to grow, to to experience something that we've perhaps never imagined or never thought. And uh, we are going to uh, certainly take advantage of this particular uh, most recent season and appreciate that next week we will jump headlong into the season of Advent, uh, preparing us for the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to the celebration of Christmas and, and uh, remembering uniquely that uh, our celebration as people of God is, is one that is uh, at times in sync with the calendar of our larger society, but always distinct in how we celebrate. Amen. That, that ever since uh, the beginning of time, if you will, God has always called out a few folk uh, to remember time and exist in time differently. And uh, I know for many of us who are uh, woke or conscious, amen, uh, many of us who have a, a deep sense and, and dare I even say connection to the pain of the way time and place and seasons often uh, perpetuate certain kinds of oppression or, or difficulty or hardships. How I many know sometimes it can be very difficult to uh, enjoy seasons as they are celebrated by the larger culture? <clears throat> and, and it's so fascinating because, uh, you know, uh, it, it, for, for many of us who, who have uh, come of at least some kind of consciousness of uh, systemic and structural oppression, violence, and racism and whatnot, uh, it's in the last five or six years, this season, if you will, this week between, say, Christmas and, uh, or Thanksgiving and, and, and the start of Advent has been a very painful season for many folks uh, who have lost their children or loved ones uh, to state violence. And, and, and so for even those who are celebrating uh, or existing in time as it currently uh, plays itself out, we are always called to redeem the time, meaning to make the time its best use, uh, to not allow time to be this kind of rogue element or train that you just jump on and you ride wherever it goes. But sometimes you got to pump the brakes of the train you're on and uh, force yourself to remember that God is calling for us to respond even in time in a way that is faithful to who God is and what God is calling us to do. Anybody in here ever had to realize that, man, there's a calendar that this society has and then there's a calendar that God has. And, and, and sometimes I'm called to even in the midst of the, the calendar of this society, I'm called to take notice that God is doing something, or at least God is calling me to do something or us to do something, even while folks right next to me are going on with their regularly scheduled program. Uh, I don't know about you, but it can be quite annoying when God has got you marching on the upbeat and everybody else is marching on the downbeat. Or you clapping on the one, three, and they... Clapping on the two four. You get my point, amen. We 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 all can just be marching to our own different beat. But I always am called back to remembering that uh as we said when we first started, there is always a season and a time for everything. And as we prepare ourselves to transition from this 
sermon on seasons, may we move into this next season with a lot of what we'll talk about, about today, gratitude and intentionality. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter number 17, verse number 11 through 19. This is, for many, a pretty familiar passage of Scripture uh, that speaks to the many, many ways in which uh, God is always uh, exposing the margins to us as the center, amen, of God's story. Uh, Luke chapter number 17, verse 11. This is uh, in keeping with the very powerful theme, if you will, of Luke's gospel, the universality of the message of Jesus, that Jesus, although he came as a Jew to the Jewish uh, uh, culture and people as the Messiah, Luke was very intentional in Luke's gospel of making sure that this message applied to everyone. Somebody say everyone. And it is important, I think, to appreciate that in the book of Luke, Luke made special, special care to highlight the ways God brought the margins to the center. Because in many of the cultures, uh, folks that have power, folks that have position, folks that are uh, preferred, uh, they're always being uh, centered in the conversation. But Luke always brought women to the center of the conversation to help folks realize that Jesus was concerned not just about the men in the story, but also the plight of women in the story. Uh, Jesus, uh, Luke always uh, lifted up the poor in uh, his text because uh, Luke wanted all the poor folks to know in the text or in their culture that Jesus was not just obsessed with people who had a lot of wealth and who had a lot of positionality. And particularly in this story, we're going to talk about lepers. Luke was very serious about putting people with diseases, both spiritual and natural, at the center of the story because Luke wanted everybody uh, who was afflicted in any kind of way to realize that this message is especially for you too. And what is the great thing about the way Luke does the writing and telling of his gospel is the margins not only become the center, but they become our example on how to be faithful to who God is and what God is calling us to be. Now, for many of you who, you know, got your stuff all together, that just went over your head and that's not a big deal. But for the rest of us who got a little bit of something, something going on, all the time. Anybody got something going on all the time, or at least 99% of the time, praise God, 90%, 80%, a good chunk of the time. This is good news that, that God will always find a way to turn your situation into an opportunity for a huge encounter that makes your life and your situation meaningful. That's some good news, somebody. Hello, that's some good news. Luke chapter 17, then verse number 11. Let's see what the word of the Lord reads. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. I can spend a whole lot of time just talking about what do you do between Samaria and Galilee, but I won't, but just use your imagination about how hard it is to live and be stuck in a place between your promise and your pain. Maybe I'll integrate that a little more. That felt good to me, even in my spirit. Verse number 12, and as Jesus entered a village, 10 lepers approached him, keeping their distance. They called out saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when Jesus saw them, Jesus said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of the lepers, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then Jesus said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. We're going to talk uh, 
let's see. Today, I think uh, the title for the sermon is Maximizing Divine Encounters. So I think what I, is that, yep, touch your name, amen. Maximizing Divine Encounters. Bow your heads with us as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to say thank you. Thank you for the gift of this text and your word that is a light unto our feet, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Bless every word that has been read and every word that will be spoken. Bless me as I preach your word. Hide me behind your cross. Send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. This is our prayer in Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Oh, give your neighbor a high five and tell them, maximize your encounter with God. Oh, tell somebody else, you better maximize it now. Amen. Tell somebody else, don't lose out. Don't miss out on this encounter with God. I love a quote that C.S. Lewis says that God... shouts to us in our pain and whispers to us in our triumphs. And it is certainly one of the hardest, I think, and most difficult truths that we who know God is real, like, you know, fall. And then there are some folk, even in here today, who are somewhat suspicious and skeptical. And that's fine, and that's great, because... You know, Jesus had disciples who were doubters and skeptical, so you in the number. All right? Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, we all in the number. We all in the number. Touch your neighbor. Amen. And we in the dark, too. Praise God. It is particularly difficult, though, for us who have been convinced beyond some level of doubt. We have more conviction than we have doubt. It is true, there does become moments and times where you and I have to wrestle with the evidence of our moment. The tension, the tug and pull, if you will, of, man, God, I know you're real and I know you're, 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 you're good, you know, because they say it every, every week in church. They wouldn't lie to me in church for the most part, amen. You know, they they they, they would tell me the truth, so to speak. Uh, and yet, when you leave church, or even while you're in church, you are aware that there is a gap between Galilee and where you are either in Samaria or on your way to a place where you can feel at home. These, the, these transitions, this constant moving, this reality of pain and suffering and challenge is indicative of every single human being, every single life that would uh, unfold in time, in the time, real time, will We'll have some seasons where you will not feel like you are in alignment with not only the promises of God, but with what you know God's intentions are for our lives. And that will create a lot of dissonance, you know. Uh, it'll, It'll force you to reckon with some beliefs that you thought were fixed until you considered the evidence. And, and, and part of what I have found most compelling about uh, the text, particularly when it lifts up lepers and leprosy, is that this is arguably one of the most uh, convincing expressions of sickness in Scripture. If you were a leper, you were reminded every day of your life that you were not well. Not only in your physical body were you reminded, but in your social interactions, 
you were consistently reminded by others that you were not well. You know, some of us have a sickness and illness that if we didn't tell anybody, they would not know. And so we can move throughout our society and our culture, and we could be functional, whatever you want to call it. We could be a functional addict. There's some folk who are just addicted to substances, but they figure out a way to function relatively well. Now, you know, when you are overtaken in some kind of addiction, uh, some kind of habit, uh, you know, the covers will always come off at least for a brief moment, amen, and folks will get a chance to be like, oh, snap, that's, 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 yeah, yeah, that's a problem. And then you're able to cover it up real quick and be like, ha, 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 you know, you know, and you make up an excuse. And, and, you know, usually folks will give you the benefit of the doubt the first or second time. And then after a while, folks will just not say much. They'll just be like, okay, that's your issue, your addiction, your challenge, rearing his head. And, you know, for all of us who are less judgmental than the next person, we won't dwell on it too much, lest our own thing rear its ugly head, and then we don't get the grace extended to us uh, that we fail to extend to others. Amen. Am I in somebody's business today? Amen. I don't know. Uh, and and so, 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 so there is a, a illness and a sickness that can be rendered invisible to many of us. But then there is a sickness and an illness that is on perpetual display. And one of the great Challenges we have as followers of Jesus, ch children of God, certainly people created in the image of God, is that even when we have the visible manifestation of disease or even sin, we can forget that we have still been created in the image of God. That even with all of your idiosyncrasies, conundrums, enigmas, that you have or that you represent, even with all of that, God still has divinely imprinted in you the image of God that never is diminished by your sickness. But when you're going through life, how many of you know that our sickness and our disease can overwhelm us that we forget that I am created in the image of God. And what is the benefit of being created in the image of God? Is that you have a perpetual expression or thumbprint of God in you at all times. That you're not trying to recover the image of God because you are already a part of God's image. Or dare I say, you are reflecting God's image. But the challenge for many of us, and dare I say, in seasons of difficulty, is that the difficulty can bury us in such a way that all we see is the dirt. And we can't see the image of God. Not just in ourselves, but even in other people. Leprosy is, is, is one of these kinds of diseases, if you will, that creates scales over our eyes and causes you and I to miss out on God's divine presence and the opportunity for a perpetual encounter. Leprosy, particularly when you Peel back how leprosy was uh, largely understood. Today, I think it's called Hansen's disease. And it was one of these kind of conditions where uh, you had sores and wounds that were unable to be healed. And because these wounds and sores were unable to be healed, they would easily get infected. And, and, and one of the reasons, fascinating enough, is, is that your, your, your wounds and your limbs would lose the ability to touch and feel. And so uh, the, the very mundane daily 
exercises that you and I would do without touch could actually be fatal to us, or at least very crippling. You know, it's this idea that, you know, uh, the, 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 the resistance that your hand feels when a door is locked keeps you from turning the door knob until you hurt yourself. Man, very basic thing. You know, if you see a door is locked and, 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 and you try to turn it and it doesn't turn, you'll stop turning. But can you imagine if you don't even feel the resistance in the just mundane task of trying to open a locked door that you would keep turning until the skin ripped off of your flesh? Or you may be walking and, 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 and because your toes don't have any feeling, you'll knock your foot up against a, a rock or, 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 or something or another, and you won't even pay attention to it. You won't know that you've actually injured yourself, and because you don't attend to that injury on your toe, it will become infected, and it will, it will get all kinds of uh, uh, gangrene and, 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 and things that, that may force that toe to be cut off. It, 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 it forces you leprosy to, to have to realize that, man, I do not have the ability to take good care of myself. But then it also causes others to feel a certain distance from you as well. Because in as much as we all have a certain level of empathy and sympathy for folk, how many know there is a limit to the average person's sympathy? Amen. Man, it's quiet in here, but I know it's right. Amen. A lot of folk, when you see them with open wounds, you don't see a lot of folk running to people that you don't know with open wounds trying to figure out how do you stop them from having bodily fluids pouring out of them. You kind of like, ooh, that's your natural instinct. Ooh, you kind of grab yourself, right? Or at least you, 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 you kind of respond back because there's something internally wired that when you see a wound that is big enough, you retreat because that wound signifies danger or at least a level of vulnerability that you yourself are not comfortable with. Lepers in the text, they also are, are usually excommunicated from their community because people are worried about contamination. Even when it's not an infectious disease, folk just assume that it is, so they kick you out. So not only are you left with a wound that you can't heal, you are left without a community to heal you. Leprosy and lepers, then in the text, would often find their own communities to hang out with because they realized that unless I find someone who is like me, I'm going to have to walk this difficult road alone. So lepers start to hang out with other lepers, and rather than being used to people who have no leprosy, they only become familiar with people who are just, if not more sick than them. I want to submit to you that all of us in this fallen world are afflicted with some form of leprosy. Some kind of social, spiritual, emotional, familial, relational isolation and sickness that keeps us from being able to fully remember and recognize that we are created in the image of God, and so is the person next to you who has a form of leprosy as well. And I want to submit and argue that when we forget that we are created in God's image, it is how social leprosy runs amok. So we, 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 we look at all the expressions of social leprosy, if you will. This week, every week, we see things happening 
that should bother us to our core except that we have forgotten. We are all created in the image of God, so we only resonate with the things that look like our leprosy. Rather than realizing that all of us are sick and all of us are in need of a physician, of a savior, of someone who can deal with the specificity of our sickness and help us be made well. This week, I and all of us continue to be bowled over by the expression and the reality of social leprosy. It was deeply hurtful and, and damaging to see the reports of slavery in Libya and these bodies of young and old, dark-skinned folk being tied and auctioned off and sold. And it demonstrated to me that even though we think we're modern and in a different reality and era, that dehumanization is still a form of social leprosy run amok in the world. I was looking at another thing of young women who are still being kidnapped and being forced into marriage and, 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 and just folks being snatched off the street and being forced into marriage in certain parts of the world. And they said, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, every four hours, a young woman is being kidnapped off the streets and being forced into marriage. And, and this kind of human trafficking and kidnapping still happening in an era where our societies would claim to be so developed. An expression of the church version of Me Too popped up this week. People are giving these encounters and examples of how they were abused or assaulted or violated even within religious spaces. Exposing the leprosy of patriarchy and misogyny that is readily available for all of us to see. But we don't have the sympathy, the empathy, the courage to address it. Watching the attack in Egypt, 300 and something or so folks' lives were lost and there were images of people running around limbless right after children's bodies being taken up. And, 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 and then there was an attempted attack in London. And the attempted attack in London made it onto the news. And this attack in Egypt that stole hundreds of lives was not even mentioned, except on social media. And it reminded me that anti-blackness and religious extremism is a form of social leprosy. Run amok when we have the ability to turn away. And then this week, of course, the killing of Mario Woods in San Francisco will come upon three years on December 2nd. Tamir Rice was killed during this week several years ago. Michael Brown's non-indictment happened several years ago. Jordan Davis was killed during this season several years ago, which continues to remind us that this predatory system is another expression of social leprosy. Pastor, why are you talking about all, all this leprosy in this way? Because this leprosy requires a response from we who not only are followers of Jesus, but we who can at least acknowledge that in some way we are complicit, inflicted, affected with our own kind of leprosy that requires an encounter with God. Or else we may hold ourselves off in a community of lepers that look like us and never experience the encounter that can shift, change, heal, and make whole. Not only our collective of lepers, 
but our whole social leprous community. I want to submit to you that one of the great things that we have with the highlighting of lepers in the text is that it shows us that lepers are not invisible to God. That sickness and evil and struggle do not escape God's view. Even if we all try to erase it out of our own. Hallelujah. How many know there's a whole lot of work you and I can do to hide our leprosy? There's a whole lot of different narratives we can try to tell to make our leprosy feel more a palatable than the leper you don't like. But at the end of the day, child of God, that leprosy is causing you and I to be isolated from that which God is calling us into community with. And you and I can't move through the seasons of our lives isolated from those whom God is calling us to be in relationship with. Or you may continue to resonate only with those who have no ability to help you be well. So the question you and I have to ask ourselves is if you and I created the image of God, even with all the leprosy that we have, both individual or social, what is then our task in this season and this moment? To make sure that the image of God that is always stamped within us becomes the invitation to an encounter that keeps us being made well. Rather than us becoming used to being locked in a leprous state. There's nothing worse, I believe, than becoming content with your content. Your, your illness, your sickness, and not believing that better is coming. Hello, somebody. That better is coming. Even if your healing never is complete, you ought to still be able to know that better is coming. Better is a inheritance for the child of God. It is just as real as your sickness, better. It is as concrete as your disease, better. That God, when you get in an encounter with God, God can make it all better. Hello, somebody. Not in the great by and by, but God can make it better even right now. Pat yourself on the chest and say, God can make it better. God can make it better. God can make it better. Child of God, one of the things then that you and I have to continue to understand, first off, if we take the text seriously, is that those who were inflicted with leprosy, those who were designated as lepers, they had to do a few things in order to make sure that this encounter with God was not only maximized, but that it happened in the first place. They had to take some risky approaches to get to God. Somebody say a risky approach, a risky approach. Verse number 12, it says clearly that the 10 lepers, they approached Jesus, but they kept their distance. And this, this, this could be a sermon all by itself, but, 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 but we don't have time to, to, to just go that deep into it, but I'm going to park here for a little while because there's a couple things that you and I need to appreciate. If you're going to have an encounter with God that maximizes God's healing and God's activity, you have to do some things that are risky. Your approach to God must force you out of your comfort zone. And I got one even better for you. Your approach to God may make some other folks uncomfortable as well. Because there are places where people would love to confine you to. Because your presence makes them uncomfortable. Here in the text, they were excluded from the town. And it was a... A, 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 a declaration that was made by the people in the town. Somebody's family told them, no, you can't be around. You need to 
go out there. And, and someone's neighbor told this person, no, you know, you, 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 your presence is, is contaminating my space, so you need to go out there. And there were all kind of legal and, 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 and priestly laws and, and customs that forced them to live on the outskirts, the margins of the center. And yet, when Jesus walks up, they decided to take a risk. They decided to defy someone else's declaration about who, how, and where they should go be and engage. A risky approach. But even their riskiness was still measured because the scripture says that they kept a distance. And it just asked me, forced me to ask all kinds of questions that I, I just want to lift up a little bit for you today. What good is it to approach Jesus but still remain distant? If you're going to come to Jesus, why not just get all in? You know, I, and I, I get some, why some of us, because we've been so disappointed with how we've understood Jesus, with religion, with all these other kinds of expressions of Jesus, whether it's the church, whether it's the preacher, whether it's your mom and them, whether it's how you read the text. And so you kind of a little bit measured. You're like, Jesus, I know that you are kind of the light of the world. And I can tell because the moment you step into my life, all of the darkness begins to recede. But I don't know if I want to jump in with both feet just yet, Jesus. Because, you know, this, this both feet business is an all-in type thing. And as much as I don't like my leprosy, I am afraid of what life would look like without it. Have you ever been, 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 been locked into a, a posture of life because you are afraid of what life would look like without that which you currently despise? You know, the way they talk about it is the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. But how about the angel? in the story. Hello, somebody. How, how about the good that is awaiting your engagement? How about the good, the promise, the faithfulness that is awaiting your encounter? It's as if I'm going to stay here because I'm afraid of the encounter of the promise that God has already made, which means to me that too many of us have allowed our despair, our difficulty to bury the possibility of promise. But I want to submit to you today that if you are going to get everything you need in this season, you better be willing to make some risky approaches to Jesus. Don't sit there and die because you're afraid to live. Get up and make an approach. Take a chance that that marriage can be restored. Take a chance that your child will not be defined by the worst thing they've done. Take a chance that justice is as close to you and us as our ability to bear witness to it in the public square. Take a chance. You don't have to stay in a place of leprosy without better knocking on your front door. Child of God, you and I have to keep making these bold approaches to Jesus. And I got to tell you, why do we talk to God the least about what concerns us the most? Ain't it something then we can talk to everybody that knows just as much as we do. I call it not a cone of silence. I call it a cone of echoes. Hallelujah. You surround yourself with a bunch of folk that just believe the same thing you believe, like what you like, look, look how you look, eat what you eat, wear the hair, same hairstyle, same clothes, the same music, and then you wonder why you're always in the same situation. Wish I could talk to somebody in here today. I'm not telling you to lose all your friends, but I am telling you to find some new ones. Find some other voices. And ask 
ask God, Lord, help the voices, the people that you bring into my life, help them to push me beyond my cone of echoes. I know you need some affirmation in your life, but too much affirmation can create lots of arrogance. But there's another word I want to use, uh, 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 hubris. Hello, somebody. Too much affirmation can create a lot of hubris in us. Because we, 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 if someone don't tell you that your stuff stinks sometime, hello, somebody. So are your encounters with God risky enough? That's the first question I want you to think about. These lepers saw Jesus approaching and they approached Jesus. They were risking death. But they were so low that they realized that I can only go up from here. Don't you dare, don't you dare approach God in ways that don't force you to reckon with the vulnerability of your existence. God, help us to be risky. God, I want to believe you for things that I know I could not do on my own. Somebody say risky. God, I want to approach you in ways that push the boundaries of what others say is appropriate. Somebody say risky. God, I want to love folk. I want to embrace folk. I want to, I want to live in this fallen world in such a way that people are always wondering, man, why are you so reckless with your love? with your service, with your faithfulness. It don't take all that. Well, yes, it does. Because you don't know how deep my leprosy goes. You see, this leprosy, when I am, am, am being risky in my approach to God, then I believe that I am opening up a space for the radical healing that God is always bringing to those who are risky enough to reach for it. Somebody just reach up real quick and say, risky, risky, risky. The second thing that, that, that I think you and I should appreciate in this text is that healing happens as you go. Verse number 14, as they went. Somebody say, as they went. Say it again, as they went. Say it again, as they went. They were made clean. And too many of us will have an encounter with God and want to build our lives off of the encounter moment. It happened in the scriptures when the disciples were up on the mountain with Jesus and they had that great encounter. The first response from the disciples, we got to build an altar. We got to build an altar and we got to stay here. Jesus is like, no, I got to go die. No, Jesus, no, no, you, no, no, you go do what you got to do, but I want to stay here. How many know that? Our encounters can put us in a rut. Hello, somebody. Any, anybody ever been stuck in a cycle and you keep going around the mulberry bush? And you, you, you think you're making progress, but this encounter is the anchor for your life. And your healing is not happening because you are stuck in the same place. You're moving, but you ain't going. No, I hope you're getting my point because as silly as I look, this is how some of us look. And, and I, get, I, get, I could go real fast, I won't, because I'm a little out of shape and I'm a little sick. But I could work up a sweat running around in circles. I could be gasping. I, I, could, even, I could even have all kind of, you know, uh, you know my, 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 my trainer that I don't listen to uh, t talks to me about, I got to do more cardio because I changed my diet. He's a pastor, you got to do more cardio. And I'm like, God bless you, Amen. But I can get cardio running around this same spot. But there's a difference 
between you moving forward and you just moving. And I need some of us to become much more committed to having a compass called the Holy Spirit that can make sure you are moving forward. Not every direction will get you to your healing. Jesus told them in the story, go show yourselves to the priest. Now, they have been outside the city for a long time, but it seemed like they knew where to go. They didn't all just scatter in different directions. They all went in a particular direction. I want you, child of God, to appreciate that the Holy Spirit is your compass, and you need to make sure that you are following in the direction towards your healing. Your healing happens as you go towards your healing. You can get stuck in the season by going around the mulberry bush rather than moving towards your healing. And this is one of the great problems with our country is that we are caught in a cyclical nightmare. We keep going around the mulberry bush of human hierarchy, racial animus, injustice, capitalistic exploitation. And we keep wondering, why won't we make progress? Oh, we make a little bit of progress. A few more of us can get inside the, the, the system that is falling apart. But those systems and these systems, even in our churches, in our communities, are not progressing towards human flourishing. So rather than us, you know, being made well, we're being made more sick. Because we're not moving according to the compass towards our healing. And I want to submit to you, child of God, that there is healing that God has for many of us in this season. Social healing, personal healing, relational healing. But we got to make sure that we are moving towards that healing. I I have so many concrete things that I had to learn towards my healing, what towards my healing looks like. Therapy towards my healing. Fasting towards my healing. Cutting some folk off towards my healing. Forgiveness towards my healing. Sacrificial living towards my healing. Unlearning certain kinds of behaviors towards my healing healing. Don't get stuck in the anchor of your encounter that you can't untether yourself to get closer to your healing. Because I hear Jesus saying, as you go, you will be made clean as you move forward. As you take that step forward, you will be made clean. Out of all the ten that God healed, only one turned back. And we can talk a long time about only why one turned back. But I just want you to be clear that you will always need to be the one who acknowledges God, you did this, and I'm going to intentionally have an attitude of gratitude. 
One of the greatest tricks and deceptions of this age, certainly of this moment, is to cause us to think we have no reason to be thankful. Trouble is indeed all around us. But how many of you know that God is still showing up? If you don't know God is showing up, you may need to take a journal. And just think of all the ways that God is still showing up. And if you can't get excited about that, you need to definitely have a journal of how God showed up for you in the past. Because if God did it before, child of God, God can do it again. Why? He's the same God back then as he is right now. So if God was a healer for you some years ago, guess what God can still do? If, if God repaired that which was broken, guess what God can still do? If God can create good things out of chaos, guess what God can still do? If God can deliver God's people from the hand of the enemy, guess what God can still do? In this story, if God can take the margins and place them in the center and make them the hero of God's story, guess what God can still do? Stand up on your feet, child of God, and let's Maximize our encounter with God. Grab the hand of the person next to you. And let's ask God right now, Lord, I need you to clarify for me and for us Help my loved one who I'm touching to be reminded, Lord, that they are created in your image and that even though there may be some pain and difficulty and struggle in this season, Lord, your image can never be diminished. So let the light of your image shine brightly through the negativity of their moment and circumstance. I pray, God, that as I'm touching them, Lord, that they will be reminded that you have always created space for encounters. I pray, God, that this moment will be an encounter with your spirit, an encounter, Lord God, that helps them to see and to know that their situation is never greater than your power to save, your power to heal, your power to deliver. I pray, God, that you will speak to them in a way that is oh so clear. Some are stuck in a rut of an encounter that has caused them to feel crippled or anchored to something that was meant to be temporary and they've made it an appointment that has run too long i pray god they'll stop moving in circles and they'll start moving towards healing lord i pray that healing god will come as they move towards healing not as they Remain in, stuck in a position, but God, I pray that as they move towards healing, the leprosy will begin to disappear. Better will begin to emerge. As an act of faith, I pray, God, that, Lord, you will help our leprosy 
to dissipate. Now lift those hands right where you're standing, Lord. It's me. And I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's not my mother. It's not my father. It's not my sister. Nor is it my brother, but it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you, God. I need you, Lord God, to visit me. I need you, Lord God, to show up so my faith can be made alive to the point I can take a bold risk. I can get out of the boat. I can move beyond this place of death. I can reach out to you. I can call out your name. I can defy the odds, the narratives that said this is my permanent condition. God, I need you to show up so I can take a bold risk, a risk to trust you, a risk to believe, a risk to move. In the name of Jesus, God, I pray that salvation to my soul, salvation, to my mind, salvation, to my body, salvation, to our community, salvation, to this country, and even to the world. God, may it continue to unfold and, and break in our lives as we step towards healing, righteousness, peace, holiness, justice, forgiveness, and redemption. This is our prayer. Somebody say, touch me, Lord. Somebody say, touch me, Lord. Somebody say, touch me, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. God, we need you. Take a few moments and lift those hands to God. And, and let the Lord, let the Lord meet you right there where you're standing. Say it again, I say, I am not. The same. I've been changed. I've been changed. Hey. In your glory. Say it again. I am not the same. Say, I, I am not the same. I've been changed. I've been changed. In your glory, God. In your glory. Say it again. Lift your hands and tell the Lord, I, I am not the same. I've been changed. I've been changed. In your glory. In your glory. I am not the same. Say I, I am not the same. I've been changed. I've been changed. In your glory. In your glory. One more time. I am not the same. Say I, I am not the same. Hey, I. In your glory, God. In your glory. You may be here today, listen, and you are stuck in a rut or you need to take a more bold approach to Jesus. Jesus is within your view, but you're still too distant. You're still allowing your circumstance to lock you in a place. And I hear Jesus saying, I just want you to take a step, take a bold approach to me. I want you to come and meet us here at the altar as your first bold step. To move beyond your circumstance. Move beyond your leprous condition. Yes. And say, God, I will step forward. I will meet you as I'm traveling. And God, I will move towards my healing. Is there anyone today that will say, I need to come and I need to touch and agree. I need to experience a different encounter with God based off of the circumstance of my situation. If this is you, take a few moments and meet us here at the altar and let the power of God, let the anointing of God, let the spirit of God begin to transform us. Lift those hands and say, I am not I.